Our next speaker comes straight from Canada. Um, he's quite active in the PHP community lately. You may know him for his contributions to PHP League packages like uh, Glide and Plates. He runs a small web development company called Code Distillery. And uh, he's here to, to talk about framework agnostic code. Please welcome on stage Jonathan Reinhardt. Thank you, and thanks for attending my talk. Um, as mentioned, I'm here to talk to you about framework agnostic code. Real quick, a little bit more about myself. Uh, my name's Jonathan, I am from Canada, and I do not speak French. Uh, a lot of people think that just because I'm from Canada that means I do speak French, but of all our provinces, we have 12 provinces, actually only one of the provinces, Quebec, is French speaking, so, um, yeah, I took French to grade 12, and that's kind of where that ended, so. I've been uh, writing PHP for about 15 years now. It's been basically my career. Uh, most of the time, it's been at a marketing agency, but in the last year, I started my own business, and I'm doing the freelance contractor thing, which is going really awesome, working from home. And uh, as mentioned as well, I'm pretty active in open source, or at least I try to be active. I wasn't always like that. I kind of made a conscious decision about two years ago to become more involved, um, both to give back, but also to just uh, make myself a better developer. And to, by surrounding myself with people who work in the open source community, it, it certainly has helped me become a better developer. Most of my work uh, that I do in open source is with an organization called the PHP League, also known as the League of Extraordinary Packages. Uh, so our goal is to build high quality framework agnostic PHP packages. So the league is still very young. We actually only got going, I think, in 2013. Uh, and at this point, we have 30 packages, uh, and they continue to gain popularity. Uh, we add the odd package, new package here and there, but our goal is really <clears throat> on the quality. We want really good quality packages that people can rely on, and when they start using them, know that they're going to be around for a long time. So what exactly does framework agnostic mean? Um, it's a phrase we use a lot of the league, um, but maybe we take it for granted that everyone just knows what that means, so I'm gonna define it. it uh, it's basically code that works independent of a framework. Um, and that basically means it doesn't have any dependencies on that framework or a framework. <clears throat> framework agnostic doesn't mean framework intolerant. So this isn't a framework versus no framework discussion. Uh, I'd say that pretty much everybody on the PHP League uses a framework day to day for their projects. So that's not really what this is about. You can absolutely use framework agnostic code in a PHP framework. So why do we want to use framework agnostic code? Um, well, the real big benefit here is that framework agnostic code is more reusable than framework specific code. Um, and, and really, that benefit there is that frame, re, reusable code is code that we don't have to write. So that's the big benefit. The reason why we wanna use framework agnostic code, or sorry, not framework agnostic code, just re, the reason we wanna use uh, more reusable, uh, framework agnostic code is, sorry, is that we do wanna use code that's more reusable and that we don't have to write. Now this may sound obvious, code that we don't have to re write ourselves is great, but think about that for a second. Day in, day out, when you're going about your jobs, to have existing code that you don't have to write, that you can rely on to do your job is massive. And we're all doing this already. <clears throat> I believe that creating reusable code is key to the continued success of PHP. As software becomes increasingly more complex, our reliance on existing quality packages and code increases. Um, there's just way too much going on nowadays for us to be able to solve all these problems on our own, and we shouldn't be afraid to use proven code in our projects. For some people, this is maybe a stretch. Um, I know for me at one point, I felt like I was the only one that could do things right and it had to be done my way, and if it wasn't done my way, then you know I couldn't use it. So I tended to reinvent things over and over, and I didn't leverage awesome code that was out there, available, free, and open source. So I also see a future where various PHP communities 
more actively share code with one another, and this is actually already happening within the last few years. Uh, it's pretty exciting, and I really believe that we're gonna be stronger by working together. So then you might wonder, well, why exactly are we using framework-specific code to begin with? And I'd say it's because we sort of had to. So there's a bit of a history side of this talk, and it goes back to 1994. So I break apart the PHP's history into basically three main time periods, or ages as I'm calling them. Uh, 94 to 2004, I'm calling the vanilla PHP age. 2005 to 2012 is the age of frameworks, and 2013 and beyond is the age of packages. So first, the age of vanilla PHP. And by vanilla, I just mean plain old PHP code. So Rasmus started working on PHP sometime in 94, and it was this amazing new tool that let us build these uh, incredible dynamic websites. And we all hacked away for quite a while. Uh, yes, our code was pretty spaghetti. We mixed our models and our views and our controllers all together in one file. But it was a pretty exciting time. It was amazing what we could create. PHP became a career for many of us, and we started making money. We started finding ways to write code better as well. And not only better, but we found ways to write it faster. At that time, PHP had a decent standard library, but there was a lot of pieces missing. Things like routing, templating, database abstraction, error management, caching, session handling and validation, these sort of things. Now, I don't necessarily mean that all these things should have been in the actual core of PHP on its own, but I more mean that these things were needed for us to, do, you know, to run our applications, uh, and they didn't exist. So developers started writing new focused PHP libraries. So this was kind of the natural step. And I, I still remember the first vendor package I pulled in. Uh, I think it was, uh, it was a templating library by a guy named Paul Jones. And I just remember being like so amazed. I'm like, oh, I have this piece of code. I can pull it into my library or in my project, and it just works, and it's not something I have to worry about. Uh, so that was awesome. And not only that, it kind of gave me a different way of looking at the problem that he was solving. It, it, uh, that was sort of the first time I was even introduced to model view controller, or at least uh, uh, controller and, and view. Uh, and that was probably in 2000. So we still had a problem, though, because we had no easy way to share those packages um, and that code. And we didn't even have GitHub back then. I don't actually know when GitHub started. If we did have it, it wasn't really being used. So what we did is we manually downloaded zip files. And that worked okay, um, because it felt like progress, but there was a whole bunch of problems that came with it. Uh, when you had to release a bug fix, or if you're, you know, the developer's web hosting company went down, or website went down, you couldn't grab those files. Uh, managing versions was a nightmare. It was a, overall a very manual process. So PHP had to do something to correct this. So we came up with Pear. I forget the actual gentleman's name who came up with this, but this was in 2000, I believe, around there. So Pear was PHP's first package manager. So, and it had some pretty awesome goals uh, to provide a consistent, so this is actually, if you look up their website from back in, I think, 2000 to 2002 on the archive uh, machine, Wayback Machine, you can find this. Their goal was to provide a consistent means for library code authors to share their code with other devs, to give the PHP community an infrastructure for sharing code, to define standards that help developers write portable and reusable code, and to provide tools for code maintenance and distribution. So it sounds pretty awesome. I could totally buy into that. Problem is, Pear had some issues. It was hard to install. It was difficult to get code onto the main repository because I, there was an approval process. Many of the packages were out of date, so for people using it, it wasn't great. And probably the biggest issue was the fact that dependencies were installed system-wide. So if you had different versions of dependencies across different projects, it just didn't work. So unfortunately, the community basically gave up on Pear, and we still didn't have a reliable way of sharing, the, sharing code in PHP. Which brings us to 2005, what I'm calling the beginning of the age of frameworks. So reusable code was packaged up into libraries called frameworks. This was basically the community's way of saying, we have this problem, we don't know how to solve it, we don't have a package manager, so this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna bundle all these common components, these things that we know we need for every project into these things called frameworks. Frameworks were easy to download and they just worked. It was, 
um, a lot simpler, basically. And it wasn't new to PHP either. This was being done successfully uh, with Rails in uh, Ruby and with Django in Python. So they, they, I don't know if the inspiration came from there, but it was certainly something that was being done successfully elsewhere. Frameworks came with basically everything you needed for the average project. Things like your template and your routing, your database ORMs and your error handling. Frameworks, best of all, allowed us to get work done quickly. We wanted to get projects done. We wanted to make money. This was a huge step forward for us, and basically everyone jumped on the framework bandwagon. 2015 became the year of the PHP frameworks. That was a year that we saw frameworks like Symfony, Cake, Solar, and others pop up. And if you're wondering, 2006, some more came. Uh, Zen Framework, I believe, started in 2006, and Code Igniter as well. Code Igniter obviously beca became huge. But we still had a problem. What if frameworks didn't have the functionality we needed? So really, frameworks were a band-aid to a problem. They didn't completely solve this issue. So, and naturally, frameworks grew to accommodate a wide range of use cases. Uh, they were forked and then forked again and then forked again, and we literally had hundreds of frameworks before we knew it. All the while, we continued to download zip files for packages that didn't make sense within a framework. Then, everything changed, which brings us to 2013. 2013, I'm these are rough dates, um, but I'm, I'm saying this because that's sort of the year that things, the uh, Composer, uh, who here is familiar with, is anybody here not familiar with Composer? Well, you wouldn't want to raise your hand anyway. Is everyone familiar with Composer? Um, so this is basically what happened. In 2009, an organization called the PHP Fig was formed, and then in 2012, Composer launched. So I believe Jordy and uh, I forget the other gentleman who works on that project, I believe they started working on it in 2011 and, and then it more or less launched in 2012, but it became widely adopted in 2013. It, so the framework PHP Interop Group, also known as the PHP FIG. So this started roughly in 2009. That was kind of the first meeting that they had it was more of just a meeting about discussing whether or not this was something that they wanted to do. So the PHP fig develops standards which make it easier for projects and frameworks to work together. And they call these PSRs or PHP standard recommendations. So this is from their website. We're a group of established PHP projects whose goal is to talk about commonalities between our projects and find ways that we can work better together. Kind of sounds familiar. If you remember one of the goals of Pair, it was to define standards that help developers write portable and reusable code. So that was kind of taking that angle, the standards angle. So the very first recommendation they made was an auto-loading standard called PSR0, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. Uh, and PSR0 basically defined how to do class auto-loading or including uh, classes in your code. And the FIG continues to develop additional standards to make sharing code easier. Um, in addition to the autoloader, they have a bunch of um, standardized interfaces uh, for like logging and requests, uh, and there's more in the works. And they have uh, some stuff around coding styles, uh, PSR uh, 1 and 2. And then they also have a bunch of more stuff in the works. I would recommend, if you're interested in this at all, to go to their website, phpfig. Uh, .org and learn more about the, the work that they're doing. So then the second big thing, as mentioned, was Composer. So it basically, this is really the thing that made the biggest change. Uh, it was PHP, I don't know if I can call it PHP's second package manager, because I have a feeling that there was probably more, um, but it was certainly the second one that actually got adopted uh, after Pair. So it was, this came out roughly 12 years after Pair had, had, had started. So unlike Pear, Composer, fortunately, got a lot of things right. It kind of did three main things. It downloaded the packages, so actually pulled down the code from wherever it was hosted. Um, it resolved their dependencies, and it auto-loaded their classes. 
And what was cool is it actually used the, the PHP, figs, new, PHP figs new PSR0 standard. So Composer was basically exactly what PHP needed to solve its code sharing problem. And Composer was an overnight success. It became mainstream as mentioned in 2013. Packages started popping up everywhere. It was amazing. And by everywhere, I actually only mean on packages, the main Composer repository that everyone is free to put their code on. There's no approval process. You just hook it up. So then it kind of begs a question, why are we still using frameworks? Um, does it mean that we don't have to use frameworks anymore now that we have Composer, now that we can have all these framework agnostic packages? Well, the answer is obviously no. Uh, frameworks still serve a purpose. I would say in the age of packages, the purpose of a framework is changing. Uh, it's no longer about, a framework is no longer, no longer has to be everything to everyone. Frameworks are now more of a glue that you use to glue your different pieces together. So you'd use your base framework that would give you kind of the out of the box default functionality, but it does it, frameworks don't have to, you know, try to do so many things before. They can be a lot slimmer and just focus on a few things. Uh, and then is, if you need some other functionality, you just do a composer require and you pull in that package. What's interesting is a lot of frameworks nowadays are actually being built using framework agnostic code. Uh, so it doesn't only help uh, end users, it actually helps framework developers as well. So I'm trying to think of, there's a bunch of them that do it. Like Laravel came out, I think Laravel came out shortly in around 2013 and it used, I think it was maybe one of the first frameworks that actually used Composer and packages by default. But now all of them, all of them are doing, and Symfony would have done it, I think pretty much right near the beginning. Um, and then Cake and Zend and, and all these other frameworks are now doing this as well. So it's, it's, it's got a dual benefit there. Um, I believe that framework agnostic code pulls communities together. So this, as mentioned at the beginning, I feel like this is kind of one of the most exciting parts about this. Like to date, we developers tended to live in the communities that they belong, like, that they use, the community of the framework that they be belong to, if you want to put it that way, that they used. Um, so, you know, people ask, well, what kind of, what kind of PHP developer are you? Are you a, you know, are you a, a Zen guy or are you a, a Symphony girl or, or do you use Laravel or what is it? And that's how we kind of talked about ourselves, which I think is, is kind of not good. There's nothing wrong with using these, these frameworks, obviously, but we're, we're PHP developers. We're not specific to a framework and, and there's no reason why that we can't talk to other communities and learn from other communities and work together and benefit from each other. And this is starting to happen more and more, uh, which is a huge reason why the PHP fig was formed because that's exactly what they were trying to solve. We're saying, hey, we, we, we're, we're solving similar problems. How can we work together more on this? So framework agnostic code is also good for package maintainers. Um, as a person who, as someone who's developed a couple open source packages myself, uh, they can be a ton of work. Uh, it's, it, I, if you've never done it, um, I recommend that you do it, but be warned, don't bite off more than you can chew because it's a lot of work. Um, and it's, it's not necessarily only developing the, the code that you want to release, it's all the ancillary stuff that comes around it. Uh, managing pull requests, managing uh, bugs, releasing new features, writing documentation, writing doc blocks, maintaining a continuous integration system, writing tests, like all this stuff takes time. So as, as a package uh, maintainer, it's really, it's really great that I can create a piece of code that can be used by a lot more communities than just say one framework. So I guess I would say, ask you this, maybe a bit of a sales pitch to say, if you're a maintainer of a framework specific package, please consider making it framework agnostic. Uh, most often it doesn't take that much effort. I think a lot of times what happens is it's just kind of the natural thing we do. Oh, I'm working on a project, I need this package, I don't, can't find the package so I'm gonna create the package and I happen to be using Symfony so I'm gonna make a Symfony package or I happen to be using Laravel so I'm gonna use that and then you, you end up creating this package that has a bunch of dependencies on that framework when in reality if you had just sort of looked at it from the beginning and say, well, what dependencies do I actually need on this framework? 
Do I need any of them? Like, do I use a helper file that's part of that framework? Well, if I can just, if I can just use a basic, you know, one of the core PHP functions instead, well, you've removed that dependency and now that library is available to a lot more people. It's not always that way. Sometimes you actually legitimately need a dependency. So I'm not saying it's like black and white, always make framework agnostic packages. I'm just saying consider it, look at it, because it's, it's gonna benefit you and it's gonna benefit the rest of the community. This will take, uh, require a bit of a change in thinking. Uh, we've been in the age of frameworks for a long time. Uh, and anytime things shift, it kind of requires some mental uh, shifting as well. So just, it's something that we got to start working toward. And, and I think the best way to understand it is every time you pull in somebody else's framework agnostic package for your code or for your project, just realize the benefit that you're gaining by that and, and try to do the same thing. And if you do want to support a specific framework, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's not that this is about not using frameworks. If you do want to support a specific framework, you can absolutely do that. Uh, and I, the best way to do this at this time is to do it using service providers. So service providers are basically really simple packages that offer some sort of helper, helper functions or classes or whatever for wiring up your packages in your specific framework. So on my Glide project, which is one of the league, pack, uh, league, league projects, I don't know if you can see that or not, but I've got a bunch of, um, a bunch of these packages that I've created for Glide that makes it easier to use Glide in specific frameworks. So you can use the, the, the Laravel one or the Cake PHP one or the Symphony one or the Slim one or the Zen one. Um, and, and this is really awesome because it also allows me to write the specific tests that go along with those packages in those individual packages. So when I have to do a dev require to pull in, say, some framework to run some tests, I don't have to put that in my main package. And, and because by putting it in my main package, then I'm going to get tons and tons of frame, tons and tons of framework code being downloaded when I actually don't need it. So that that has like a really nice side benefit when it comes to testing. And if you're op releasing open source uh, packages, you should most certainly have tests for them. Um, so one last thing I'm going to leave you with is a resource that I had put together. I did this a couple years ago um, at True North PHP in Canada and Toronto. And uh, it's basically a checklist that goes through a whole bunch of steps. I think there's 14 basically steps that say um, just tips, advice uh, on how to properly open source uh, a package, a PHP package. Um, it's, not, it's less about the actual code and it's more about all the details around it. So that's a, that's a helpful resource if you're interested in learning more about how to, how to write framework agnostic packages. So I guess I'll ask the, last, that, the first question again, just to end here, uh, why framework agnostic code? And I would say, because it can be. In today's age, we can do this. And really before 2013, it was really, really hard. So that's all I have, thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. We have time for one question. Um, how do you manage uh, the versioning between uh, your main uh, component and uh, the different bundles for each uh, framework? Do you use some kind of, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, very carefully. Um, I use just, you, they're standard composer packages, right? So. Uh, you would just manage the versioning the exact same way that any other two packages would use Composer and your Composer.json file to, to set the dependencies that it needs. So, for example, if I have, say, my Glide Laravel package, I would, in there, it would, it would actually require first Glide, and then it would require whatever version of Laravel that I would need to run it on. Um, I, I guess the only thing I would say there is if you're developing your own open source packages is to be very as wide as or wide with your versioning constraints as you possibly can. Uh, if you get too, spe this isn't a situation where you want to be specific. In your application, you want to be very specific, as specific as you can. Uh, well, not even necessarily there because you could run into conflicts. But I would say, especially with um, uh, with an open source project, you want to be as wide ranging as you can. So I think on my project, like I think I'm, I'm trying to think of the f Laravel one. I want to say that it requires PHP. Our Laravel 5, and meaning it would work on 5.1 and 5.2, but it might even support 4. Like, I basically, 
because it's such a, s a specific thing, you can a lot of times make it really, that, that constraint really wide. I don't know if that helps to answer your question. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, thanks everyone.